So yes, we're going to give you a, a bit of a collaborative presentation today. So we've got um, myself and John, who are the landscape architects at Arup, and Nick, who is a lighting designer, because it's very much how we work. It's about a, always a collaborative approach in design. I will start off with a five-minute presentation on the drivers of landscape design, and then Nick will move on to the approach of lighting master planning, and then John will finish off with a case study on using landscape and lighting design in the context of a, a real project. So landscape architecture, it's rooted in the understanding of how the environment works and what makes a place unique, its context. It's a blend of science, art, design, vision, and thought. And any action that changes the condition or appearance must consider the effect of the wider landscape. So that's what we do, it's seeing the bigger picture. And it encompasses both cities, everything outside your front door, from parks to green roofs to streetscapes. What's happened to my slide there? Oh, there it is, to the countryside and the interface between people and natural systems. And a, a, a perfect case study to, to illustrate this was the Cambridge Guided Busway project that we've recently worked on, where huge efforts went with landscape and ecology to mitigate the effects of the busway, and we worked together creating new ecological sites and extensions to existing ecological sites. We also, that we also work on a huge range of project, projects which range from master planning Olympic sites. We were heavily involved on the Olympic Park and we worked in an integrated team which shaped the quality of the urban and landscape spaces along the river, accommodating flood risk management measures as well. And we plan, manage landscapes as well, like national parks and and AOMBs, Areas of Outstanding Natural Beauty. And currently we're working on HS2, and our role as landscape architects here is to ensure that the railway is sensitively planned, designed, and mitigated in terms of the surrounding landscape, particularly through nationally protected Chilterns AOMB. And then, of course, maybe it's like more, in more familiar terms, we design public squares and parks, and landscape architecture is all about nurturing the communities that make them the human environment livable. Landscape architects have to be broad thinkers on the end result and how to get there. When, when you put landscape at the heart of a development, then developers profit, and therefore the businesses and the communities reap the economic benefits of that. Also, integrating landscape architecture at the start of the project is essential so that you can set up key objectives and exploit opportunities. And a perfect example of this is the Bean Parklands project that we were involved in in East London, which is 53 hectares of wetlands, where in the end we managed to, all the excavated material was reused outside of the Environment Agency land holdings. And that was as a result of a heavy involvement with stakeholders and funding and avoided huge bills to landfill tax. It's also very difficult to influence a project unless you start at the beginning if, if, you know, if change is very difficult in the middle or later stages of a project and obviously it costs a lot more. So we have to understand the site and to understand the site we will We'd identify all the existing features of landscape value, whether it's trees or rivers or woodlands, and these things help us understand the character and how, it, how a new development might knit into the existing fabric of that landscape. We have to respect the historic context of a site. We have to understand pedestrian networks and connectivity and community wishes and needs, and all this ensures that the landscape is attractive, valued, and usable. As we've touched on landscape architecture, landscape architects, we work with a huge range of professionals from architects to town planners to lighting engineers to ecologists to civil engineers, the list goes on. And we create places for people to live and work and play, 
but also places for plants and animals to thrive. My final slide is on um, Cities Alive, which is a new collaborative Arab initiative that we're actually launching in the next couple of weeks that involves landscape architects, planners, ecologists, and it's all about how landscape architecture is having an increasingly important role in addressing climate change. And it looks to recognize the vital role of natural environments and sustainable urban development and climate change resilience. And it's so fundamental in the impact on economic, our economic prosperity, health and well-being. And the two pictures I've chosen to, to include here are the possible future of our cities where trees may be glowing with bioluminescent technology instead of electricity, and footpaths may be lit with particles that absorb and reflect light instead of using electricity. So I'll hand you over to Nick now. Lydia? Good afternoon. Uh, I'd like to yes. explain how uh, lighting designers work within a design team on a, a project, uh, and some of the constraints that, that we, we work under. Um, the first question for us always is, uh, why use light? Um, the, obviously, we light for people, principally. Um, and they, we're looking at safety, uh, perceptions of security, uh, and uh, so people can move, ease of movement uh, around a site. Lighting also allows uh, a nighttime economy. It extends the day. Lighting can also excite and inform, uh, give an identity to a space. And in addition, it helps provide orientation for people. The idea of creating identity for a site is, uh, means there has to be a strong lighting concept. And just referring to one, uh, one project we did last year, looking at the uh, redevelopment of the TV centre uh, in West London, we looked at using light to try and reference the industrial past of the site uh, in the change to a mixed-use development. Uh, the site is uh, bounded by a uh, pointed to a major road uh, on the east side, the main entrance to the site here, strong central focus. And then to the west, there's existing parkland. The lighting structure we adopted was to have the idea of light emanating from the center uh, and uh, radiating out. This was expressed in terms of the use of light color going from cooler light at the main entrance uh, and the plaza here, and steadily as you move to the perimeter, going to warmer light colors. And similarly, that's reflected in terms of light intensity, with the highest light intensity uh, at the, the plaza and the main entrance, and letting light intensity fall as you move out towards the perimeter. Now, there's quite a lot of thought that goes into developing a lighting concept and a lot of work with the landscape architects uh, and building architects. It, it has to be agreed with the, with the team. Uh, and I think as Dan was saying yesterday that uh, there's often a lot of resistance to people, uh, people are quite resistant to changing a master plan once it's in place and agreed. Um, there's quite... It has quite a, a big impact on a design team if an issue comes in late in the state, uh, late in the process. If it comes in early, it can be developed into the master plan. In this site, uh, there was a, we were aware that along this boundary, there was an existing uh, back corridor. So we were able to start to factor that in and address it in the master plan. Moving from a sketch plan of how we think light should operate in the space, we then have to apply some of the standards. And the main ones that apply in lighting are BS 5489, which is the code of practice uh, for road lighting. Uh, 
BSEN 13201, uh, which again sets standards for road lighting uh, and how the, the choices you can make for appropriate levels. And uh, BS 12464, which is lighting outdoor workplaces. These are recommendations, they're guidance, they're not mandatory. Um, but if they're applied intelligently, the, then we can create a map which sets out light levels for different zones <coughs> and we can structure the light across the site in the way that we'd set out in the master plan. However, there are other constraints on us. Sustainability codes, code for sustainable homes, uh, BRIAM, these are schemes that developers uh, will use to establish a sustainability rating for, for their development. Now, these will re refer back to the British standards, and it moves them from being advice into requirements for compliance. And this is where, the, by adopting some of the elements of sustainability codes, the lighting parameters can get locked down. So it moves from a recommendation to de facto regulation. Um, the sustainability codes, there are conflicts inherent in them. Uh, and often uh, a more positive way to look at them is that they, they can flush out issues if there's a choice between lighting for people or lighting for ecology and do that at quite an early stage. Um, so those conflicts or, or divisions can, can be addressed early by the design team. Along with sustainability codes, there are a whole set of additional requirements that come in, secured by design, which sets specific parameters for light levels, and not necessarily sensibly in all instances. Park mark for parking areas, the, um, uh, secured by design for new homes. So steadily you build up a mass of, of constraints around, around what you do. So these need to be addressed quite carefully by the design team. Planning requirements tend to focus on uh, CIE 150, or, um, and Alan discussed this yesterday, the, the ILP's guidance notes. And these are principally about uh, reduction of nuisance light. Coming back to the BBC site, the, the TV centre site, uh, we had a specific planning requirement not to create additional light to the west side of the trees along this boundary. The road had been lit before, so it wasn't a case of no light, but uh, how little light could we use? So we structured the lighting plan from relatively high levels here coming off the main road to create a series of transitions reducing the light level round to this boundary area. And we also looked then at what other ways we could mitigate the, um, uh, the effect, the impact of the lighting on the back corridor. So we looked at the location, putting it away from the buildings, uh, lighting yes. back towards them, so we went spilling light towards the, uh, the trees. Uh, the mounting height, um, the getting the lowest reasonable level of light and using warm white light, uh, and using very clear, very strong photometric control so there was no backspill, so that we weren't effectively putting light into that zone. On another site, uh, we were looking at light spill from buildings rather than just external lighting. Um, this is a camp commercial office building in development uh, on a campus site. And the intention on this west side was to create a, um, an ecological corridor. So high level of lighting on the main plaza here and the main entrance into the building, and a much lower level of lighting along the, the facade, the west facade, uh, and again, directing the light back towards the building. <coughs> and using these sort of flat glass 
luminaires just to control the, the light and the, the direction of the spill. This is the, the building, uh, the east facade. Uh, so it's not particularly tall, um, but it, it, it's wide and long. We started doing some calculations just in the 3D model of uh, what the light spill out of the building potentially would be. So these are illumination levels on the ground plane around the building. Now, that shows us light is coming out, but it's not terribly useful. So we built a box around the building, took the, the edge of the box out to where the, the, um, the boundary was, the ecological uh, corridor was to be. And we could look then along the west facade that there actually was quite a high level, of, relatively high level of illumination, uh, even uh, that far away from the building. So we're getting up at the order of about three lux. Um, which kind of rang alarm bells, which is a point that I took this across to Austin and said, just how big a problem is this? Uh, and what's the standard uh, that we should be trying to achieve um, to not deter bats? Which is why this gathering is so useful, because it enhances our knowledge of what we should be trying to achieve. But we looked at this um, clearly. If this sort of lighting was, uh, you were getting this amount of light at uh, with the building fully occupied, at what time is that likely to occur? This is going to happen in the winter, so it's not necessarily relevant. Um, at reduced occupancy levels, which in the evening, in the spring and summer, you'd be getting a far lower um, level of, uh, of light output. So you could see here we're getting down to, to just over one lux, so we're much, much closer to what we should, uh, should be achieving. It's this kind of 3D modeling that really is, I think there's a question came up about what would, should we be asking for as ecologists. Uh, and it's this sort of uh, lighting calculation, I think, that you need so that you can see clearly what's going on uh, around the site. We also, have an impact through, through feature lighting. Uh, we lit the orbit on the Olympic site and used computer modeling to show us what our, um, the lit effect would be on the structure. But also, we had to pay attention to how much light was spilling onto the waterway. As Claire was saying uh, this morning, there were quite tight guidelines on that. So, Again, 3D modeling, we could demonstrate that we were getting well below one lux, which is the required level, onto the waterway. I hand over to John, and he'll uh, talk through some of his case studies. Okay. Hi, everyone. Afternoon. Um, my name is uh, John Rowe, and I'm a landscape architect. Um, let me just go on to the next slide. Um, I, I thought I'd talk about the type of project that I guess Arup um, is well known for, and that's a major infrastructure project. It's just um, like a brief run through it. And, and uh, more importantly, um, our, um, our role in it. Who, who, um, who here um, has, a, who here, um, has heard of the Thames Earth Tunnel? Just a quick show of hands. Oh, good. There's quite a few people. I know it's received lots of press, which isn't all good, um, but it is, a, but it is a, I'm like a major new project I'm like in London. And the, the idea for those I'm like who don't know is that it will be a new, su it will be a new sewer that, that runs along the length of the Thames, and it will take the overflow from the um, existing uh, from the existing uh, sewerage, which is which is currently overspilling into the Thames, um, it, uh, um, uh, um, in times of rainfall. And at each point where the the uh, where the new sewer links up with the old sewerage, there'll be a, a new public space created. And we, I'm like as landscape architects, I'm like have worked on the design of those spaces. 
spaces are needed in case there's ever a blockage in this pipe and it needs a sort of needs access. Although the the the, the, the thought of the, the thought of a blockage, I'm I'm making a big sewer, is is I'm a bit worrying, but never mind. So these spaces are going to be all uh, along the length of the Thames, and they 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 they, they take in a they take in a rich variety of um, environments, from the historic Tower of London through to more industrial sites in the West. And um, if proof was ever needed that this project is needed, I think it's this quote here. So I'm going to leave you to read that and um, absorb it. So I'm just going to look now at three sites, I'm like in brief, and explain the, I suppose, the, 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 the factors that influence their design. The, the, the first is at Putney, and, it's, uh, uh, and it is alongside the Grade 2 listed uh, Putney Bridge. And, uh, and, and, um, and on this site, um, we've worked with English Heritage, and they've, they've, uh, stated, um, uh, they've stated a preference that any new structure looks, looks, um, looks distinct from what is there now. One other interesting aspect of this of this site is the fact that for one day each year, it's the focus on like of world attention, as it's the start line of the university boat race. So, I'm like in terms of the design, and we are, we played on that start line. I'm like and use that. I'm like as a band uh, which will stretch out. Um, uh, across this new public space. The, the, but, the, but the space needs uh, to work on, 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 more, on, on more days than just the boat race. Um, and to that end, uh, the, the proposal is to provide um, a kiosk, um, which, would, which, would, which would then uh, help activate the space sort of throughout the rest of the year. And it's a, 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 a space where you would rest on 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 a, on, on a walk down the Thames. I'm like in terms of lighting, w w the principles throughout the the Thames project are, are to not project any light onto the river. It's it's I mean it's on, on, onto the river it's, itself. Uh, I'm, 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 um, and that was decided after speaking with um, um, after speaking with ecologists and understanding um, the 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 um, impact and um, the light could have on aquatic life. The next of these sites is uh, um, is a further east. And it is, and it's, and it's on the Albert Embankment, and it's outside the, um, it's outside the headquarters of, of MI6. Now, and beneath the bridge here, there is, there is the potential for the flat roofs. And so, so there was an interesting little, uh, design challenge, um, um, in terms of, um, in terms of, um, in terms of, um, in, terms of in terms of how we like the space, which is which would, would, would which would be the preference of um, MI6, but lighting it without disturbing the bass. So the intent is um, is it to provide low level um, um, lights in the round in in the rotunda there, and furthermore. Um, you, you know, on the on this space here, all all of the all of these all all of the all of the seating is orientated um, like away from MI6, as they um, as they are keen, and the people aren't just going to spend time on the benches. I'm looking to look at their on their building, which is understandable. 
The, 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 the third and final of these uh, sites is, uh, is, um, is at Victoria. Now, again, this is, this is this, this, um, it's one of the most high-profile ones, as it is in the middle of London. And, in fact, on this one, English, 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 um, English heritage have asked that any, any proposal um, is bold, and it, and, it is, uh, and it is distinct from what's there again. Um, so the proposal is as follows. It's to, to, um, it's to, to try to bring people closer to the water, and, it, and, and, and in doing this, one of, the, one, of the, one of the challenges is moving people over on the flood defence wall. And we, um, I'm at so on this, and we've worked with access designers. Um, I'm like in order to create a, a, a space that can be used by all. And the, if you look at the image on the on the on the far right there, and that gives you I'm like an indication of how on the landscape which which um, is visible is really only on the tip of the iceberg, because one of the major constraints on anything that we propose is the is the engineering um, that's below. Um, I'm looking finally, I'm like in terms of lighting. Um, the the uh, north bank of the Thames here apparently is a very um, high crime area, and there's lots of anti anti there's uh, and there's lots of anti social behaviour after dark. As I told him this, we would work with Nick, I mean his team, and I'd find a way to light this with with um, out projecting more spruce luminance onto the Thames. Um, and this is all in planning at the moment, which means um, this might alter again, but, it's, but it is a good project to work on, mm -hmm. so uh, I think that's about it. Thank you.